In this video tutorial, we will review some topics we learned in grades 9 and 10 science. Specifically, we'll focus on atomic theory and the historical developments leading up to our current understanding of the atom. Alright, so we all know that atoms are very small, too small to be seen. So how do we know so much about something that we've never actually seen with our own eyes? Well, through experimentation, we gather evidence and that provides us with a model. So a model is a kind of mental picture or mental image of what we believe the atom looks like. As technology improves, we collect more evidence and then we can update our model of the atom to give us a better picture of what we believe the atom is like. So how did we get to our current understanding of the atom? Our story begins with John Dalton. Now during his time, most scientists already agreed with the first three points of Dalton's atomic theory. Most scientists believe that all matter is made up of small particles and they call these atoms, which means indivisible or cannot be broken up further. And that brings us to our second point. They believe that atoms cannot be created, they cannot be destroyed, and they cannot be divided into smaller particles. Not entirely true, but not bad for a first guess. Finally, they believe that all atoms of the same element are identical in both mass and size, and so different elements would have different masses and different sizes. Again, not entirely true, but keep in mind this was the first version of our modern interpretation of what the atom is. So again, these three points were pretty well accepted by most scientists at the time. Where John Dalton shines is that he brings about this new concept and says perhaps the compounds are created by combining atoms of different elements together. So instead of having a water element, he suggested that perhaps water was made up of two other elements chemically combined together in a specific ratio. In this case, two H's and one O. So two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom combined together to create a water molecule. Just as Lego blocks can be combined in many different ways to create a variety of different structures, the elements of the periodic table can be combined to form every substance we know of in our universe. So John Dalton's model or mental picture of what the atom looked like was essentially a feature of the sphere, but these spheres were of different masses and different sizes and could be combined together to form new substances. Unfortunately, John Dalton's of the atom was a little simplistic and could not fully explain the phenomenon of cathode rays. At the time, electricity was still fairly brand new and scientists loved to experiment with it. One such experiment was using a cathode ray tube. They would first vacuum out all the air in this glass tube and then apply a very high voltage to these metal electrodes. In so doing, a stream of negatively charged particles was fired out. Since these particles came from the cathode, they called them cathode rays. Now they knew these cathode rays were negative because it was repelled by the negative terminal and attracted to the positive terminal. And a magnetic field was able to control its movements. This cathode ray technology is how early computer screens and TVs worked. So here's the cathode ray tube. It is then firing electrons out, the cathode rays. And then over here there's a magnetic deflecting plate that allows us to push the electrons and fire them at a phosphorus screen on this side. And when the electrons hit the phosphorus screen, it begins to glow. And by hitting different parts of the screen, we can then start to create an image. If you record video of an old TV screen, you can actually see the electron beam hitting the different parts of the phosphorus screen many thousands of times per second. We call this the refresh rate. If you slow down the video, you can get a better sense of what this looks like. So there it is at 2,500 frames per second. All right, and the electron beam is being fired over and over again at different points of the phosphorus screen, causing the different parts to glow at a different color. And so we slowly assemble the image of Mario running through this level line by line. Now modern televisions and computer screens no longer use this technology but I still think it's amazing. Now going back to J.J. Thompson, he discovered that these cathode rays, these negatively charged particles, were identical no matter what metal the cathode was made out of. So no matter what type of metal he used here, copper, nickel, whatever, they all seemed to contain cathode rays. Eventually these cathode rays became known as electrons. So instead of a feature of the sphere, as John Dalton theorized, J.J. Thompson says, oh no, there's something inside, and they are negatively charged particles called electrons. So now we're starting to get some more detail about these mysterious atoms. Now since most matter is electrically neutral, J.J. Thompson suggests that there must be an equally positive charge to balance things out. These positive charges would eventually be called protons. 
So now J.J. Thompson is updating the model of the atom and calling it the raisin bun model. All right, where negatively charged electrons, these raisins, are embedded in a positively charged doughy frame. So essentially the big giant raisin bun is basically positive with little negative electrons embedded inside of it as if it was raisins. And if you apply enough energy, you can actually pull these electrons out like you would pull raisins out of a bun. So by applying a high voltage to the cathode, we could pull out the electrons out of the atom itself. All right. Now, atoms or groups of atoms that have lost or gained electrons, they no longer have a neutral charge. All right. If I get an extra electron, now my atom is more negative. If I lose an electron, now my atom is more positive. So when charged, they are referred to as ions. So don't call them atoms anymore. It's better to be a little more specific and call it an ion, a charged atom. If you have a positively charged ion, we call it a cation. If you have a negatively charged ion, you call it an anion. To help you remember this, the word cation has a T in it, and the T kind of looks like a positive sign. All right, so the little T, positive sign, positive ion. Another way you can look at it is that the word cation has the word cat inside of it. Cats have paws. So you can say that the cation is positive. That is a horrible pun. Anyway, we now have a more detailed model of the atom, but there's still something missing. Enter in Ernest Rutherford and his gold foil experiment. This is literally top 10 science experiments of all time. Uh, if you are going off to university or college uh, and studying chemistry or physics, guaranteed you're going to have to repeat this experiment. That is how uh, fundamentally important this experiment is to our understanding of the atom. Now, if you recall, the Thompson model assumed that the atom was a positive mass with little negative particles called electrons embedded within it. In the gold foil experiment, a radioactive isotope of radium was placed inside a lead sealed box. There was a small hole drilled inside this lead box that allowed the radioactive alpha particles to come out. Now these alpha particles are positive charges. And as you know, when two positive charges come close to one another, they will repel each other. In the Thompson model, the positive charges are evenly spread out throughout the atom. Because these positive charges are so spread out, their ability to repel the positive alpha particles that are coming at them is greatly reduced. As such, most of these alpha particles will go straight through the gold foil with very, very little deflection. And when they come in contact with this phosphorus coated screen, there'll be a small flash to indicate where the alpha particle hit. Now, when they actually conducted the experiment, most of the alpha particles still went straight through, but there was a lot more deflections than they were expecting. And in some cases, the alpha particles were actually reflected back towards the original source. And so Rutherford suggested that the only way for these alpha particles to have such huge reflection angles is if all these positive masses were actually super concentrated in the center of the atom, a nucleus. Because positive charges that are spread out are too weak to deflect the alpha particles with such huge angles. Only a concentrated positive mass can do that. All right, so let's watch this brief animation to recap what we have just learned. Ernest Rutherford was bombarding an extremely thin gold foil with a beam of alpha particles from a radioactive source. Alpha particles have a positive charge and are far smaller than an atom. The great majority of particles passed through the foil easily, but one in every 10,000 particles was deflected backwards and came back on the same side of the foil. To account for the results of the experiment, Rutherford had to reject the Thompson model of the atom because if atoms in fact consisted of spheres with a uniformly distributed positive charge, all alpha particles would pass through the foil easily, with some possible minor deflections. Rutherford believed that the center of the atom is a positively charged nucleus, in which nearly the entire mass of the atom is concentrated. The nucleus is surrounded by a virtually empty space within which the electrons circulate. Thus, if a positively charged alpha particle passes at a considerable distance from the nucleus, it passes through the atom easily. However, 
If a particle collides with a nucleus, it is strongly repelled by the positive nuclear charge and becomes deflected, like a tennis ball hitting a cannonball. Rutherford also concluded that atomic nuclei must be very small compared to the size of whole atoms. If the great majority of alpha particles pass through tightly packed atoms as though they were empty space. So the data obtained from the gold foil experiment suggested that only a densely packed positive mass could cause the large deflection angle seen in the gold foil experiment. So from this, Ernest Rutherford came up with the beehive model, saying that the atom is mostly empty space. Most of the atom's mass is located in a densely packed nucleus, which is at the center of the atom. This nucleus contained protons, positively charged, and neutrons, neutrally charged. Meanwhile, the electrons, which are negatively charged, existed outside the nucleus, revolving around it like bees circling a hive. So, through experimentation, our model of the atom went from a featureless sphere to a raisin bun and then a beehive. Well, this experiment brings us to our modern quantum interpretation of the atom. When we shine a white light through a prism, we get a rainbow effect. But what if we don't use a white light? So this is called a gas discharge tube. Essentially, we put hydrogen gas inside a tube that's been vacuumed out so there's no other gas inside except for hydrogen, and then we apply an electrical voltage to it. When you apply electrical voltage to it, the hydrogen begins to glow. We use this technology with neon signs, where different gases emit different colors of light. If we take these gases and apply an electrical voltage to them and shine their light through a prism, instead of a continuous spectrum, we see distinct color bands appear. And each type of gas has its own unique line spectra, or pattern of visible light. To explain this phenomenon, Niels Bohr suggested that electrons could only exist in specific, stable orbitals. They could not exist anywhere else. If an electron in a high energy orbital with lower stability falls down to a lower energy level with higher stability, it will release energy, some of which will be in the visible light spectrum. So if we look at this diagram, if an electron drops from the second shell to the first shell, it releases energy in the red wavelength. And as we saw, Red is in the lower frequency, lower energy wavelength. But if it drops by two shells or three shells, it will release energy in the green wavelength or blue wavelength because they are of higher frequency and higher energy. And since every element has its own unique electron pattern, how their electrons release their energy will also be unique. And that, of course, results in a line spectra that is characteristic to each in every single element on the periodic table. So, to summarize, electrons are only stable at these specific wavelengths, thus only specific wavelengths of colors can be seen in the line spectra. And finally, electrons are able to jump from one energy level to the next without existing in the spaces between, like planets orbiting the sun. You don't see Mars orbiting the sun here one year, then jumping out over here the next year. They stay in their set orbitals. Similarly, electrons also stay in their set orbitals. All right, so let's go over a couple of uh, key terms. The center of the atom is known as the nucleus, and inside you'll find protons with a symbol of P positive and neutrons with a symbol of N zero. These little dots over here represent electrons with an E negative symbol, while each of these little rings are electron shells, or you can call them electron orbitals. And the outermost electron shell has a special name called valence shell. Electrons have a negative charge, that's why their symbol is E negative. They orbit the nucleus at a great distance, and their mass is very, very, very small in comparison to protons and neutrons. Protons have a positive charge, that's why their symbol is P with a positive sign. They exist inside the nucleus and have a mass that is very, very, very large in comparison to electrons. While neutrons have a neutral charge, that's why it's n with a zero. Inside the nucleus is where they exist, and they are the same size as protons approximately. Uh, so again, very large in comparison to the electron. Coming up next, we will introduce the periodic table.